So basically with this um, webinar, we bring together both uh, the conceptual and the theoretical side of recent research on WebNexus governance, as well as uh, practical experience on cross-sectoral cooperation. So both presentations that we will be hearing today are focusing on the MENA region, specifically on Jordan. And with this webinar, we hope to stimulate uh, further exchange between research and practice on the topics on the topic of nexus governance. And we also hope to be able to overcome existing challenges and barriers uh, that still remain uh, in decision making processes when it comes to WebNexus uh, implementation and governance. So with this, um, I'm very happy to introduce and welcome our two esteemed uh, guest speakers, Dr. Ines Dombrowski. Um, she's from the, well, German Development Institute is um, the, like the old name. They just launched a new name today. Uh, and also Ms. Hanin Sadeh. Uh, she's an energy advisor from the Energy Efficient Water Sector Program within GIZ. Um, and Ms. Hanin Sadeh, she will be replacing Dr. Luai Kwadir, who was initially announced as a speaker. Uh, so let's quickly jump over uh, to our agenda. So we will have some introductory words uh, from Irene Sander. She is the head of the Global Nexus Secretariat at GIZ um, at the Nexus Regional Dialogues Program, followed by the input of Dr. Ines, uh, Ines Dombrowski. Um, after that presentation, we will have some time for Q&A. And then we will open the floor to Hanin Sadeh, who will give some um, some words uh, and will present the Interministerial Water Energy Working Group in Jordan. So really looking at, at the practical side. Um, closing will be done by Michael Jacobson. And yeah, with this and with no longer due, I would like to hand over to Irene. Thank you, Tina. Um, so welcome to everybody. Welcome everybody. Um, also from my side, welcome to the webinar entitled "Governing the Nexus of Science Policy Dialogue." So, I, as Tina has mentioned, I've been tasked um, with providing some introductory words on the topic of the nexus, um, a term that I feel like has been coming up quite a, a lot recently, as, as awareness seems to be growing that we can no longer face a lot of the world's challenges from a single sector lens, but instead need to acknowledge the, the complex interconnections that exist between different disciplines. And I say disciplines because um, they are, there are a lot of nexuses, nexi out there. Um, but in the context of this webinar series hosted by FAO, um, we, um, we were referring to the water energy food security nexus. So why Nexus and why specifically the WEF Nexus? Uh, the Nexus approach allows us to break away from silo thinking and instead encourages a holistic view of natural resource management, embracing the fact that energy, water and agriculture cannot be confined to single sector thinking, but must instead be understood in their complexities and in their complex interrelations. So I always like to stress that the WEF Nexus is not an end in itself, um, but rather a means to an end. So we, we, we specifically say, refer to it as the WEF Nexus approach because it's, it's a way of doing things. It allows us to put on the WEF Nexus lens. And when we do so, um, we can identify the interconnections, not only the interconnections, but also the synergies that exist between these resources. And once we see those re these synergies, it allows us to also look and focus on Nexus solutions. So for example, we have reuse of treated wastewater for irrigation farms or in general, just integrated wastewater management um, for biogas production. Um, by taking on the Nexus lens, uh, we can value and invest in reforestation practices, for example, to reduce soil erosion, recharge groundwater and save hydropower infrastructure from silting up. And it can also inspire us to explore the manifold uses of renewable energies all along the agriculture value chain. However, this sort of connected thinking is not yet mainstream. Instead, policies and investments in one sector, more often than not, are made with one sector in mind, not properly taking into account possible negative effects that incur can occur in the other sectors. One, of it, one example of, for this is groundwater pumping um, for irrigation purposes, or actually solar-powered groundwater pumping for irrigation purposes, which can lead to unmanaged overexploitation of scarce resources. Um, and I believe this particular challenge will be um, 
addressed in Dr. Dombrovsky's presentation um, along the Azarak Basin case study. Um, but these uh, types of negative effects uh, and impacts don't have to be the norm, they're not inevitable. Often they're simply the result of a lack of adequate institutional structures and incentives to encourage cross-sector coordination and sometimes just missing inspiration. So this is, you see decision makers, policy makers and investors um, sticking to what they know rather than um, taking the leap of faith to explore the more unknown, which is of course very relatable. Um, but this is where the initiative um, such as the Nexus Region Dialogues program comes in. Um, the program, uh, the NRD program as we abbreviated is co-financed by the European Commission and the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development and compiles a growing evidence of integrated solutions um, and different Nexus governance set setups and makes this information available on a digital platform called the Nexus Resources Platform, uh, which I hereby would like to invite you to visit um, and explore and become an active member of. Um, um, so you can reach it under water-energy-food.org. Um, but this information is also made available in, in webinars. It's the uh, ones that we are part of um, now. Um, so as Tina has already mentioned, um, this webinar, particular webinar um, brings together Dr. Ina Stombrowski, um, representing the research community, but also my esteemed colleague, Hanin Sade from the GSZ Jordan project on uh, energy efficiency in the water sector, who will represent the practitioner's point of view. Uh, Tina has already mentioned, both speakers will be focusing on the MENA region and specifically on Jordan. The MENA region, um, perhaps more so than other regions, is facing challenges of combating and adapting to climate changes. So we see the region having to deal with water stress as droughts increase and rainfall patterns change, but also um, looking into the huge potential that is presented by renewable energies. And of course, um, news headlines have been focusing a lot on the looming food security crisis that is hovering over the region, as, over the region, as many of the countries in the MENA region have strong trade relations with Russia and Ukraine, um, specifically um, the strong dependency on wheat, imports that from those two countries um, and here I, I look especially at Egypt and, and Lebanon where the dependency reaches 80 percent. Of course these geopolitical developments will um, have a, will have lead a lot of policymakers to look for quick solutions and rightfully so as the humanitarian crisis um, uh, emerges but we we should also use this um, crisis in the situation to point to important long-term solutions that are based on systemic change as propagated by the nexus approach because no single sector organization can try drive this transition alone and it's with these words that i would like to um, hand over back to tina and and that i yeah just would like to mention one more time how excited I am to, to, to hear the contributions from our speakers um, and also uh, discuss and engage with you, the audience, um, on how we can go from cross-sectoral thinking to cross-sectoral action. Tina, back to you. Hello. Um, thank you, Irene. So I would like to hand over actually right away to our next esteemed speaker, Ms. Ines Dombrowski. Thank you. Okay, let me share my slide with you. Slides. So can you see the presentation mode? I yes, guess. Okay, yes. great, thanks. Uh, Aujourd'hui, c'est la journée de renommée, donc la CICU, c'est IDOS aujourd'hui, donc ça va être la dernière fois où je vais utiliser l'ancien nom aujourd'hui. Donc, mon, mon, ma présentation... Conceptual Foundations and Empirical Insights from Jordan. And I've specifically been also asked to say something about how we can conceptualize with Nexus, Nexus Governance. Um, 
yeah, as you know, I mean, we have just heard about the Nexus, uh, and one way to look at it is that we uh, need to achieve at least three different securities, water, energy, and food security. I think we also seek to achieve a less than two degrees world, but by doing so, we draw on the same resource set, including water, soils, and biodiversity. Um, the WEF Nexus has been around um, for quite a while now. I mean, it has been prom predom uh, prominently launched in 2011. Um, and uh, actually, it serves different purposes. It's an analytical tool. Um, it's also a conceptual framework, and it's also a, a discourse, which we are maybe taking forward today. Um, in the meantime, quite a lot of research has uh, um, been done on the Nexus, mainly focusing on the bio interdependencies in the biophysical world. So, um, yeah, according to some assessments, about 70% of the publications are quantitative assessments. Um, and I think that has contributed towards um, a better understanding of the interlinkages between these different uh, resource using uh, sectors. However, uh, the REF Nexus is also a governance challenge, as many of you will also experience on the ground, I think. And in view of this, um, there have been many calls that uh, we need a better cross-sectoral coordination and also better multi-level governance. Um, uh, so it's about horizontal and also vertical um, coordination uh, while considering the geographical scale of the interdependencies. Um, however, um, yeah, this, despite the significant evidence on interlinkages, uh, I think it's fair to say that still a limited progress has been made towards more coherent um, policies and, and, and respective vertical and horizontal coordination. So uh, today I'm um, presenting a polycentricity lens to understand decision making and coordination uh, related to the REF Nexus. Um, so let me write, um, so I will first have a, a short, uh, or the first half of the presentation will be more conceptual and then I will present um, our um, case study research from Jordan, where we apply that framework. Um, so polycentricity, that is a concept that has been introduced originally by Vincent Ostrom in the 60s, uh, looking at metropolitan governance. And uh, he basically argued that um, uh, here we face many centers of decision making uh, that are formally independent, however, they can be functionally interdependent. And, uh, uh, he observed that uh, these in cities, these uh, enter into uh, different kinds of relationships and as such um, start functioning as a system. And these relationships um, can be competitive. Um, yeah, when we have market incentives, they can be cooperative or they could um, be coercive um, when recourse is made to a central conflict resolution mechanisms, for instance. Um, so basically what that indicates is that we have three underlying um, governance modes of, of coordination being, um, uh, yeah, uh, competition through markets, uh, cooperation of, um, through, uh, for instance, networks or contracts and uh, uh, coercion through hierarchies. So uh, we, I, and when I say we, I'm, I'm talking also, I mean, of work that has been developed jointly with uh, my colleague um, Srinivasa Srigi. Uh, we argue that WEF securities provision is organized in formally dependent and functionally interdependent sectors. And uh, thus, uh, uh, we, we uh, yeah, WEF Nexus is governed in is always governed in polycentric systems, but they might be more coordinated or less coordinated. And we are asking for the conditions of achieving coordination um, among strategies for securing these three se securities. Um, and in order to somehow uh, yeah, depict uh, 
uh, these interrelations. Um, here in this graph, you see um, the three different action, so-called action situations, and I will explain in a minute what I mean by this, um, na namely on providing water, energy, and food security. And all them, all of them draw on the same resource base, um, including water, soil, and biodiversity. As such, um, establishing this um, transaction interdependence that is um, indicated in the red dotted lines. And, and it's this functional interdependence through the physical interaction that calls for coordination. Um, but whether and, to, and how coordination comes about also depends on uh, the prevailing um, formal and informal institutions. It, it, it uh, depends on policy instruments in place, meaning regulatory, market-based, or informational. And um, yeah, the underlying governance modes in society such as hierarchies, markets, and networks. I would say we always have all three of them, but um, some governance mode um, uh, might be more prevalent in one case uh, than the other. Um, and they also depend on the constitutional, meta-constitutional and social political framework conditions. So um, we believe that it's important to really um, also, I mean, next to understanding the physical interlinkages better, to understand these uh, governance interlinkages better. And we um, uh, do so by um, drawing on the Ostrom um, school. So you might know that Eleanor Ostrom received in, in 2009 the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, for her work on uh, the sustainable governance of, of common pool resources. And uh, she has developed the institutional development and analysis framework. And I would invite you first now to look only in the, at the left uh, picture. Um, uh, which is a framework to to analyze uh, um, yeah interaction of uh, participating actors um, in terms of certain outcomes and the factors that determine this interaction. Um, so the core of uh, uh, the framework is the action situation, which is defined as a situation where, where two or more individuals are faced with a set of potential actions that produce joint outcomes through their interaction. So we have the participants that interact. Um, the interaction could be based on the three governance modes and they produce outcomes. And um, these interactions are determined, that's the hypothesis, by um, A, the biophysical and material conditions, B, by the attributes of the community or of the actors, so to say, and uh, third, by rules or yeah, formal and informal institutions. And um, the whole thing is a feedback process, so outcomes again uh, um, influence can influence both the exogenous variables and and the action situation. Um, I will later go into an example to 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 um, to show how this can be disentangled. Now. Um, uh, in order to better understand the different rule systems, um, Ostrom um, distinguishes uh, seven different rules and they are here, shown here on the right hand side. I'm not going here into the details. It's just to mention that, that um, yeah, rules um, can be of various types and, and um, uh, we have uh, the analytics to um, disentangle the rule systems. And um, now, uh, in a ref nexus situation, we argue that we need to look at networks of adjacent action situations because we do not only have one action situation of decision making, but um, interdependent related action situations. And the theory here also argues that an action situation is adjacent um, to another one if the outcome of the first action situation directly influences the value of one or more of the working components of the second action situation. So for instance, um, um, a situation where a water policy is created um, that might influence the the behavior of a farmer on the ground. And then um, that water policy uh, is adjacent to the extra situation of uh, water abstraction decisions by the farmer. 
Now, um, this framework has also been criticized in the literature um, that with the heavy focus on institutions, it often neglects power. But um, uh, I think also all practitioners will know that, uh, that power considerations and political economy considerations are also very important to consider in analyzing web nexus situations. And um, therefore, uh, we follow other scholars who add uh, power relations as one of the exogenous variables, so to say, as one of the um, conditioning, conditioning institutional processes that lead to particular outcomes. And uh, for the WEF Nexus, we have, so to say, translated the IAD into this uh, little picture, what we would usually assume um, as a situation. So, um, and um, maybe it's also important to say when studying these uh, networks of action situations, it's quite useful to, to focus on a focal action situation as the core um, problem of interacting with the resource system. So um, in a web nexus situation, we usually have certain actors that directly interact with the resource, such as farmers abstracting water or water supply companies or power producers um, also needing water resources. Um, now, we argue that their action choices are determined by a whole zoo of um, other action situations, also at different levels of governance. And uh, we use here the Ostromian um, differentiation of or idea of nested institutions um, that we might have operational choice institutions that directly affect the operations, but that are also determined by um, uh, institutions at higher levels um, that say who has the uh, decision making authority to make operational choice um, institutions, etc. Um, practically, that also translates often into, um, yeah, uh, certain institutions more at a local level and then at higher levels, um, including uh, regional and national and even um, international levels. Um, so in, in Nexus governance, uh, sometimes we have local resource management committees, um, sometimes we have basin organizations that can play a role, but we know that the Nexus could also stretch beyond basins, uh, so it could also be about um, the allocation of water use permits uh, more generally, for instance. Um, and uh, sometimes we also have coordination mechanisms at national level that seek to ensure greater cross-sectoral and um, um, cross-level coordination, for instance, based on the IWRM concept. Um, but here, this is really then informing and also influenced by the various sectors that um, with their policies also um, influence the focal action situation. And um, yeah, that again is influenced by context contextual factors such as the biophysical conditions, the power structures, the rules in use, and the attributes of the community. And in the end, produces um, certain outcomes with respect to water, energy, and food security, which can be evaluated against um, certain criteria, including efficiency, equity, sustainability, or, or accountability. So let me uh, leave it here with, with the conceptual foundations and um, jump into the case study. Um, and yeah, this is a case study uh, we carried out in, um, in the course, by the way, of the um, DIEs or IDOS um, postgraduate uh, program where we educate um, master holders for uh, work in international cooperation. Um, and we did this in early 2020, just before the pandemic um, bro broke out. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we um, did a case study of the ASRAC um, basin in, in Jordan, which is located in the Eastern Desert region of, um, of Jordan, um, where we have a situation where um, yeah, domestic agricultural and environmental users compete for groundwater, for scarce groundwater resources, which is a general problem in Jordan. 
and um, over exploit um, this basin at least at a rate of 260 percent and uh, yeah it's a wef nexus situation in the sense that uh, yeah water is needed for drinking water supply and for agricultural production for food production but also for um, uh, environment here because uh, in Azraq um, this used to be a very um, important uh, um, oasis providing many environmental services and um, it's also a, a bird um, stop on the flyway from from Europe to Africa. Um, so Azraq is a Ramsar site and uh, um, also needs to provide um, these functions. Um, but due to the heavy pumping, um, the oasis has already shrunk a lot and will become completely would have become completely dried if if water was not artificially supplied to the oasis. Um, while uh, quite some studies have been done on Azraq um, from various disciplinary perspectives, we argue that the intersectoral um, competition has not comprehensively analyzed before. So we asked which factors influence the decision of the different groundwater users in Azraq and what then would be intervention points for sustainability transitions. And we exactly um, apply uh, the, this combination, I mean, this institutional analysis development framework and the NAS concept. Um, and in order to understand um, um, informal factors and power better, we draw on the concept of the social contract, the political economy concept, and also take VASTA as an informal norm in Jordan into in the MENO region into account. So what's the social contract um, that has been defined as the implicit agreements between all relevant societal groups and the sovereign defining their rights and obligations towards each other. Um, and so in Jordan, um, there is an understanding that that um, influential groups um, support uh, uh, the king and uh, then also receive certain privileges um, for their support. And uh, water could be access to water could be one of these privileges. And Wasta um, is a local form of nepotism, one could say. It's a mutually felt obligation to provide favorable treatment to members of the same tribe or family, um, which also plays then a role in the decision making process. Um, so as I mentioned, we did this research in 2020. So it's also the state of, I mean, the analysis is the state of 2020. And I hope we will also get some um, updates um, um, from Hanin then later. Um, and uh, we conducted 67 semi-structured interviews next to an analysis of literature and policy documents. And we identified our um, network of action situations, initial network in, in a mapping exercise with our local Jordanian partners. So let's jump in our main findings and let's have, have first uh, cross a look at the focal action situation of that competition. So you, you see some of the numbers, um, both in terms of the sustainable yield and, and the uses, and you can see that about 80% of um, the sustainable yield is used for domestic supply and that water is pumped then from Asrak to the main consumption centers, um, mainly Sarka, but um, also Amman. Um, which doesn't leave a lot of water uh, for other uses, um, but nevertheless, agriculture is kind of prospering and uh, agriculture uses even double the amount than the domestic use, um, uh, which then overall leads to that high overdraft of the safe yield, which by the way, is also only an estimate and not um, and we have heard voices that um, it could be much lower than um, this number, but this is the number the government um, uses. And from the water that is pumped by the government, um, some water is supplied to the 
wetland, wetland, but that's a minor share. So basically, we have a situation where uh, the government prioritizes um, the water for domestic supply, but um, still farmers um, also use significant um, amounts of water, which then leads to this heavy overuse, dropping groundwater levels and salinization, and could probably lead to a situation where in future um, farming will not be possible anymore. Um, now, why do we have the situation that the farmers abstract the water despite the prioritization of the government for domestic supply? And here um, we assume, I, I want to mention the most important factors that we found um, that influence the farmer decisions. decisions. So, um, one factor is that we have a very shallow um, aquifer that is easy to access. One factor is that we have a quite heterogeneous group. We have three um, main ethnic uh, groups um, who traditionally um, settled in the area, but then um, also um, since the 80s uh, in the last um, century, uh, um, commercial farmers have started Exploring, and you have seen these large plots in the eastern part of the desert here, um, uh, which also leads to little trust among some of the farmers. Um, then we have a situation where farmers often have very little information about the um, physical conditions of the aquifer and often have misconceptions. So some farmers believe there are streams under the um, under the ground and, and they can just um, draw from these rivers underground. Um, uh, there is no tradition of communication among the farmers on water use. There's only exchange on, on for instance, I mean, on, on, on tech, technological agroeconomic, oh, sorry, agro um, practices. Um, and uh, it's also not the case that there would be a limit by the government on the amount that a well can abstract, but um, the amount that is ab abstracted is determined by um, physical conditions by, and, and by costs, so to say. And the costs include pumping costs and they include a water fee. But the water fee is quite low for legal wells. Um, but given that we have the shallow aquifer, we have many illegal wells, and for these illegal wells, there's a higher water price, and that's the government intervention to incentivize uh, lower water use. And I will dip, dig into this in more detail um, in the next slides. So that's basically that situation um, on the ground. So how, how can we understand the situation? And in order to understand our focal action situation that is um, shown here in the white box on the bottom of the graph, we have identified um, more than 30 linkages um, uh, um, to other action situations that influence that situation. So you, you can see it's uh, quite... Um, complex. Um, and I will obviously not be able in the limited time to go through um, all of this, um, uh, but I will um, try to mention the most important points and I've marked them here in red. So um, I will talk about um, important sectors that influence the situation, but also high level decision making and the social contract as well as donors. Um, uh, so at, uh, we argue that at the collective choice level, um, the most important situation to look into is the water governance situation, so the water sector. This, as I already mentioned, prioritizes domestic or agricultural water use, and ASRAC covers 6% 6 of the domestic supply. Um, the, the water authorities are trying um, to close um, illegal wells. Um, uh, and, and in particular, they're imposing these relatively high water prices on registered illegal wells. And since um, 2014, have started to enforce these uh, higher prices or these prices um, through um, a remote sensing monitoring approach. So um, not going to the farmers reading meters, um, 
because here there was also quite some conflict on the ground, but um, um, estimating the uses based on um, remote sensing. Um, this, however, has led to a situation where uh, while some very few farmers might have given up uh, farming, most continue and instead organize themselves and organize marches in front of the Ministry of Water and Irrigation in order to negotiate rebates. And um, in fact, we have heard that rebates on these water prices of up, up to 80% have been given so that we are still force, um, facing an enforcement issue. Um, However, we also found that uh, other sectors also partly provide previous incentives that could stimulate groundwater abstraction. Um, for land governance, um, the, the situation is uh, as such that in order to gain legal land titles, uh, land needs to be farmed uh, for at least 10 years and partly um, land, yeah, prospective landowners or people occupying land in the desert, um, just plant trees in order to gain legal land titles, which would then also be the prerequisite for legal well titles. So that is obviously um, a disincentive. Um, then in the past, Ministry of Agriculture has subsidized the planting of olive trees in Azraq, um, which consumes relatively high water and is at the same time um, a product that is of relatively low value given that there's a lot of olive production in, in uh, Jordan. Um, and the Ministry of Energy and Agriculture jointly also offered subsidies for solar wells, which has already been mentioned in the introduction, can then lead to a situation where um, if there are low investments, I mean, if the investment costs are subsidized, then they're also on, I mean, then people can have access to these solar wells and the operational costs are low, which can be an incentive to draw more water. So um, yeah, perverse incentives is, is a problem. Um, and then we looked into um, ways of cross-sectoral coordination and would argue that it is um, still weak. Um, in particular, there is no committee between the ministries of water and agriculture at all. So that was mentioned from both sides. There is a water energy committee and we will hear more about it um, in the other talk. And I'm, I'm really curious to hear more about the progress here. Um, when we talked to um, our interview partners, it was relatively new, there were high hopes, but um, yeah, it still had to prove itself. Um, yeah, but we also argue that um, that high level decision making and the social contract um, influenced the situation. Um, in Jordan, um, um, which is a constitutional monarchy, the king appoints the cabinet and um, other entities. Um, and one consequence, I would argue, is the frequent dismissal of prime ministers, um, which can be a means to dispel societal dissatisfaction, um, um, which is easier if the king can um, appoint a new prime minister than if that was done through a democratic process. And that is certainly a factor that makes long-term planning um, more difficult. And then, um, we have the social contract and the concept of Rasta, um, where yeah, this implicit social contract implies that influential uh, societal groups um, um, claim <laughs> they are, um, yeah, that they need their access to certain privileges and rents um, in, as exchange for their loyalty. And water can be such an um, such an issue, for instance, um, even uh, members of ministries have farms in Azraq um, and are interested in keeping these farms. Um, furthermore, uh, people that have Vasta um, can use their tribal relationships with patrons in positions of power to obtain benefits or bend rules. And um, one could argue that this is the case when the farmers protest in front of the ministry and negotiate the rebates um, on um, the water prices. And then of course, donors also 
and I think this is well known, um, play a role in this game. Um, 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 Jordan is heavily supported by donors, uh, also because it is a regional anchor of stability in the in a region um, stro stricken by conflicts um, in neighboring countries and um, even war. Um, the water sector has also um, been traditionally supported very much by Germany, for instance. Um, but of course, donor funds are also a source of rent stabilization and thus of stabilizing the social contract. Um, yeah, so let me draw some conclusions. Uh, we argue that a power sensitive um, network of adjacent action situations approach at least allows us to disentangle polycentric decision making related to the WEF nexus and to better understand how formal and informal rules, but also power um, uh, influence uh, decision making and, and the game. And um, it is for now an, an analytical um, approach to better understand um, why uh, with Nexus governance um, is sometimes not easy. Um, and um, yeah, but uh, it's certainly not an easy solution that is offered by this. Yeah. Now, in our case, uh, we argue that um, that siloed policy po policy making um, plus informal institutions are key for understanding intersectoral competition and groundwater overuse. Um, while the water sector applies, um, I would say a stick and carrot approach um, to change farmers' behavior, um, still enforcement is hindered um, by um, these informal factors. Other sectors mostly provide previous incentives. Um, committees are either absent or still have to deliver on expectations. Um, we would argue that our systems approach allows for the identification of a range of intervention points, but one has also has to acknowledge that probably the more effective interventions are also more sensitive. So while it might be relatively easy to, for instance, enhance efficiency in irrigation at the operational choice level. Um, I would argue that this will not fundamentally alter the problem given the high overdraft. So um, it will never be possible to, to um, yeah, to, to move into sustainable abstraction only based on efficiency measures. Um, measures at collective choice level, um, such as more fully implementing um, and enforcing uh, the existing regulations are more promising, but face opposition from informal structures. And probably um, in order to really um, address the allocation conflict, um, constitutional choice changes um, would, or institutions would have to be changed. And, and um, we would argue that probably a, a more comprehensive societal discourse on water allocation would be needed to address this issue. But this is, of course, also highly sensitive. So um, yeah, with respect to ASRAC, we wonder whether it's enough of a take um, for the system as large to address this fundamental question of groundwater allocation, um, or um, if this will not happen, probably the situation will, I mean, it's not only probably, but the situation will further degrade. Um, but this is, of course, only one case, and it's a very complicated and complex case. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope we will also hear a bit more uh, later about uh, maybe more uh, promising uh, solution. But for now, I thank you for your attention. And I unshare my slides, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ines, for your very interesting presentation. Um, I can already see there are some questions. However, um, due to time constraints, I would suggest to move on directly um, with our next presentation and our next speaker. Um, for the audience, I would like or I ask you to use our Q&A function in the Zoom call, or you can also use the chat to post your questions and we will make sure uh, to answer them directly. 
if we have some time left uh, in the end, we will uh, open the room again for uh, questions from the audience. So for now, um, I welcome Hanin uh, Sadeh, and she will continue with her presentation about the interministerial working group on the water energy nexus. Yeah, hello everyone. I'm glad uh, that I am uh, with you today to present uh, the interministerial work energy, um, water energy, sorry, <laughs> nexus working group and uh, the experience uh, uh, from Jordan, some efforts to manage the water energy nexus, uh, the water energy resources and uh, some uh, related investment projects and some other uh, uh, technical measures between both uh, sectors. So uh, my name is Hanin uh, Saade. I am um, the uh, energy advisor for the energy efficient uh, water sector uh, project, GIZ project in Jordan, which aims at improving the energy management in the Jordanian water sector, as well as um, supporting the uh, water energy nexus uh, cooperation and um, uh, dialogue uh, to provide approaches and uh, solutions that reduce the specific um, uh, energy cost in the water sector and um, helps uh, both sector sectors. So just to give you some background um, on the Jordanian water sector um, structure and um, institutions, um, uh, we have the Ministry of Water and Irrigation, uh, which is uh, the official body responsible for the overall monitoring of the water sector. Um, also responsible for planning, formulation of national water strategy and policies, um, research, research and development, uh, protection of water resources, uh, also preserve Jordan's right, uh, ensured uh, water, uh, water bodies. Uh, its role also includes the um, provision of centralized water related uh, data. Uh, we have also the Water Authority of Jordan, um, which is uh, the authority responsible for the supply of drinking water and wastewater disposal in Jordan. It also handles the key investment measures in the sector and owns the Jordanian water and wastewater, uh, Jordanian, uh, wastewater uh, infrastructure. Um, also uh, responsible for the development of the infrastructure, um, uh, development of all projects with private sector participation. It also oversees the water utilities um, uh, and takes, takes on some regulatory, um, sorry, some regulatory function. Um, we have uh, also the Jordan Valley Authority, which is responsible for managing, develop, uh, managing and developing, um, also protecting the water resources and land in the Jordan Valley um, area and exploit them in irrigated uh, agriculture, domestic usage, industry, municipal um, affairs and electricity generation, etc. Um, it's, the authority is also responsible for the operation and maintenance of, of dams in the country. And uh, last, we have the water utility or water supply um, companies, um, uh, the three companies, Miyah, Nayarmouk, and Aqab Water Company. As you can see here, um, uh, the, this graph is um, uh, presenting the forecast of development of water resources uh, availability, the supply requirements, and supply gap um, from 2020 to 2040. As you um, all know, Jordan um, suffers from uh, an extreme scarcity of water. And here you can see the um, available um, uh, supply resources. Uh, and those two actually are the planned supply projects. Here we have the demand scenarios. Um, here is the demand. And here you can see the demand with the non-revenue water re reductions. And um, as um, maybe uh, some of you know that the country is pursuing the development of a large scale seawater desalination, a plant, we call it a national conveyor. It's, um, the long name is called Aqab um, Amman um, Desalination and Conveyance uh, Project. Um, so it's basically the desalination of the Red Sea and conveying the water, the treated water to the capital city and other city, cities. 
the national conveyor project uh, actually alone, uh, uh, you can see that it will not cover the, uh, it will not be enough to bridge the increasing gap between demand and supply for water. So here you can see uh, it's expected to be um, operational um, in 2027, 2028, but um, the increasing demand uh, then will not be, uh, the increasing demand will not be um, met by those planned projects. So Jordan has to um, seek for other supply uh, projects for water. Um, and this has been actually, it's a part of the, um, this um, assessment, part of the third national water master plan, which is, uh, has been developed in 2021. Okay, some um, ch challenges, just to give you a brief uh, on the challenges of the water sector. As mentioned, the sector is uh, suff um, suffering from um, severe uh, water scarcity. And water deficit where they cannot, they were the uh, demand cannot be um, met, uh, and this is because of uh, dry climate um, uh, in Jordan, which um, uh, uh, imposes low precipitation and high evaporation rates. Um, uh, also, the abnormal population growth caused by the high influx of refugees um, caused uh, to increase the demand on water resources. Um, the over abstraction from groundwater uh, resources actually caused the declining of water resource um, explo exploitability and uh, also, um, as mentioned by Ennis, the salinization of um, uh, some uh, uh, water, uh, groundwater uh, resources. Um, and as you know, the all surface bodies are shared in Jordan. Um, another challenge, which is a, a major challenge, is the high non-revenue water, uh, non water uh, in the country, which amounts to 48%. Uh, and this is caused by technical, some operational, some um, physical leakage in the network and uh, improper metering and uh, administrative um, non-revenue water, which is caused by, by theft of water. Um, a major also challenge is the high electric energy consumption and the high energy cost. So the high electric energy consumption is um, um, caused by the inefficient water supply systems, uh, starting from design, operation, and lack of proper maintenance. Also, um, the topographic um, uh, conditions in, in the country um, where we have a high elevation and where the Resources are distant from uh, uh, the um, population center and also the deep uh, uh, groundwater resources. So some, sometimes they are pumping from 1,000 uh, below um, sea level and uh, also pumping um, a few hundred kilometers uh, like the DC um, uh, basin. They are conveying the water from the DC basin uh, from uh, the southern borders uh, to Amman and other cities uh, over the um, over 300 kilometers uh, of uh, pumping and also a high elevation uh, and pumping head. Uh, also due to the deter deterioration of quality and salinization of water um, and the need for further uh, treatment of uh, water. The high energy cost uh, um, caused by the high electric uh, tariff for water pumping in Jordan and it's also has been, in, uh, it's volatile, so it has been increased and decreased over the past uh, years. Uh, the sector is um, uh, uh, suffers from uh, financial deficit. It's as uh, as known, it's a subsidized sector. So, um, and this is caused by a high energy cost. Um, so, in the in the later slides, I will explain about the consumption and the cost of electricity in the water sector, and it's also. Um, and there is also um, the um, subsidized water tariff, so the sector cannot um, uh, achieve the cost recovery with this um, a very low water uh, water tariff. Um, and the geo geopolitical tension, which um, uh, yeah, as the regional conflicts um, causing the uh, several influx of refugees uh, to to the country, which um, increase the demand uh, in water. And the climate change actually is exacerbating the situation in the in in the country. So 
So here, as you can see, we have the consumption, the electric consumption uh, in the Jordanian water sector um, with a total cost. So from 2010 to, till 2019. And the cost actually, the, and the electric tariff has been um, uh, increased over the years. Um, here you can see is the annual electricity cost or electricity bill for the water sector, which is um, uh, more than 200 million uh, GOD Jordanian dinar in annually. And uh, the electricity cost actually amounts to uh, uh, Forty-three percent of the operational costs uh, in the water in the water sector. Some background on the Jordanian energy sector um, in in Jordan. Uh, as you uh, know, also we have the single buyer electricity market, uh, where we have the national electric power um, company is the grid operator and the only um, uh, off taker. Um, we have um, uh, the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources, uh, which is um, responsible for administering and organizing the energy sector in a way that achieves the national objectives. It's also responsible for the comprehensive planning and um, uh, setting the general plans and policies to, uh, to ensure um, the that the implementation of policies um, achieve the general objective of the sector. Um, it also provides provides responsible for providing the required electric uh, energy, sorry, uh, in its various forms, and um, uh, also attracting the required capital needed to invest in the sector. Um, uh, going back to the electricity sector, to talk specifically on the electricity sector, we have the generation um, uh, side or sector, the transmission, distribution, and the final uh, consumers. So the generation companies um, are responsible um, for electricity generation and selling in wholesale to the uh, NEPCO, the uh, off-taker. Um, there are actually, as you can see, several um, uh, companies, um, several conventional companies actually, and we have some uh, uh, companies um, uh, generating electricity from renewable sources such as solar and uh, wind. And we are, we are also importing electricity from uh, Egypt. So the conventional company, one is wholly uh, shared, wholly, um, sorry, uh, owned by the government. Um, and uh, we have some like um, five, uh, almost five um, IPPs, independent power producers, private companies, and uh, as mentioned, renewable and uh, importing from Egypt. Um, we have, the, um, and as mentioned, the NEPCO is a single buyer. It's the only off taker. It's a public shareholding uh, company owned by the government. It's responsible for construction, operation, and maintenance of the transmission system inside the country. It's also responsible for the interconnection. So the transmission system uh, with the no neighboring countries um, uh, also securing the power supply through expansion of gener generating units, either by private or public, um, uh, purchasing electricity from different sources and selling to distribution uh, company. Uh, yeah, I think the distribution, as you can see, we have three um, private uh, distribution companies, the ITCO, IDCO, and JIPCO who are um, uh, operated in different regions. So some in the center, some in the uh, eastern and southern part, and the other in the northern part in, in the country. In the country. Um, and we have, as you can see, the final consumers, which, um, which is the domestic, industrial, commercial, and agriculture and water pumping actually it amounts to um, uh, uh, almost 15 to 16 percent, and the public sector is um, consuming around 10 percent, and the other is uh, private um, for irrigated agriculture. So as you can see, actually, the water sector is considered the largest single electricity consu uh, consumers in the, in the country. Some challenges, or maybe before challenges, some uh, facts on the electricity sector, the generation um, the annual generation in 2020 um, amounts uh, to about 20,009, uh, almost 21,000 uh, gigawatt hour. The generation capacity um, is 5,424 megawatt. 
The peak load uh, is around uh, 3,200 3, megawatt and the minimum load 1,200 uh, mega, megawatt. And those actually cause uh, some operational constraints and challenges when operating the electrical uh, system. Uh, the RE capacity in Jordan uh, reach, uh, reach um, up to 2,100 2, megawatt, which is almost um, half the generation capacity. Uh, the RE target for 20, 2030 um, is 3,200, and there are some uh, actually studies and investigation to increase this target uh, to even more um, than this uh, number. And there are actually some uh, challenges. Uh, the main one, as um, all know, is Jordan is um, highly dependent on uh, import from uh, foreign um, uh, uh, from abroad, I mean, so it's high, uh, dependent on foreign uh, fossil fuel, uh, and this um, amounted to about 97% uh, in 2014, and um, uh, currently it's around 93% as the RE share uh, has increased over um, the past years. So this number um, has decreased, but still we have we are um, mainly, I would say, dependent on uh, foreign uh, uh, fuel. Uh, so this is actually the main and biggest challenge uh, for the sustainable economic growth for the country's um, economy and um, um, the rising energy demand and um, uh, dependency on, on import. Uh, this actually imposes a significant financial risk on the national budget because of um, the vol volatility of the oil um, uh, and gas prices uh, globally in addition to the growing energy demand because of population growth and um, urbanization and uh, other uh, factors. There are some operational and financial, um, as mentioned, financial challenge um, uh, uh, fa um, facing uh, the electricity uh, sector and NEPCO, the grid operator, uh, which um, can be summarized by high dependency on peaking units. So we have, um, a peaking hours around three to four hours, depending on the season, uh, which um, they um, are uh, operating uh, peaking, uh, expensive peaking units um, um, operated um, by fossil fuel for sure. And uh, they are also doing some RE curtailment because of the operational constraints um, and uh, the low capacity factor for base uh, units. So speaking um, about the water energy nexus in general, as um, all uh, know that um, energy is required for, for, for water abstraction and transmission. Um, also energy um, uh, is um, required for treatment and desalination, for uh, wastewater treatment, for, um, it's, not only, it's not only, I mean, um, uh, uh, the water, it's not only consuming electricity, but it, water can be used for electricity generation. So it's an uh, energy carrier. So uh, with the um, potential and kinetic energy in the water. Um, so again, it's not uh, only energy sink, but also um, can be used as energy source. Uh, so um, as all know that water and energy security uh, are strongly interlinked. Um, globally, and um, of course, Jordan is no exception. Um, so currently, interdependency or sorry, interdependencies uh, between um, the resources and managing the sectors have been um, recognized and uh, addressed. Um, uh, and the Nexus approach, actually, uh, as all know, that it looks as at the whole system and interrelations relationships uh, to understand where action need to be taken to improve the resource sustainability and um, formulate actions that um, uh, actually ensure the resource um, uh, security and integrates the perspectives of all um, uh, sector and policy formulation and um, objectives. And as we all know, the sustainable development goals, um, sex is the clean uh, water and the sanitation, uh, sustainable cities, uh, and um, communities and affordable and uh, clean energy and um, the climate change. So the water energy nexus, if managed properly, uh, can lead to those uh, four relevant uh, sustainable development goals. 
So now maybe uh, the most interesting part for the participant, uh, I will be presenting here the water energy nexus context in Jordan and um, later on some components, some um, ongoing projects, studies, and um, the existing um, uh, coordination mechanism, interministerial working groups and steering committees between uh, across the sectors. So um, the water energy nexus um, dialogue actually was launched in, 20, in 2019. Um, it has been initiated and it's uh, supported by GIZ, still supported by the GIZ, the project, um, the energy efficient water sector project. In uh, 2019, actually a steering uh, committee, the two ministers, um, the water and energy ministers um, have instructed the secretary generals to form a steering com committee, a higher a high level committee between both sectors and between relevant institutions uh, to work on uh, the water energy nexus um, uh, challenges, I would say, and some investment uh, projects. And this has afterwards uh, been endorsed by the prime minister. And he actually, um, uh, then he instructed the two, um, so sorry, first um, uh, two ministers has uh, established a committee consisting of uh, the secretary general of the um, uh, Energy and Mineral Resources, Secretary General of Water and Irrigation, Secretary General of uh, WAJ, Water Authority of Jordan and Jordan Valley as well, and the General Manager of NEBCO, Deputy Chairman of the Energy and uh, Mineral uh, Regula Minerals Regulatory Commission. Uh, afterwards, the uh, Prime Minister has endorsed this um, coordination mechanism and steering committee, and he instructed to add the Secretary General of Ministry of Planning and International Cooperation to this committee as well as the Secretary General of uh, Ministry of Finance, because they were uh, working on some large investment projects. So for sure, those uh, ministries has to be um, involved in this uh, coordination uh, mechanism. Okay, some um, uh, maybe common challenges and opportunity opportunities um, uh, in the country, um, as you all know, or as mentioned before, the, the two sectors or the, the country is um, facing a combined scarcity of water and primary energy resources. So we have the scarcity of resources. Uh, both sectors actually are suffering from technical challenges as well as financial challenges. So some maybe opportun opportunities to be um, achieved by this uh, water energy nexus management or um, uh, cooperation is the water desalination uh, with sustainable um, low cost um, energy. Uh, so as, as mentioned before, the country is uh, seriously pursuing the, this large scale desalination project to um, secure actually 300 million, which is a huge amount of um, uh, municipal water for the country. So this water desalination um, plant uh, powered by um, sustainable low cost energy uh, energy um, will uh, lead to uh, providing some uh, additional uh, water resources to the country. Uh, there is also the um, hydroelectric pumping storage that I will be also presenting in the following slides um, and which will also support the integration of uh, more renewable energy in the country. So um, storage at large scale. The technical challenges um, can also, um, oh, there are some opportunities to um, tackle those technical challenges, such as the hydroelectric pump storage that will um, uh, balance the demand and supply for the electric uh, system in the country, and will also serve some, um, uh, or provide some ancillary services for the grid uh, related to frequency control, voltage control, some, uh, some other technical challenges uh, by the for the grid. There is also the demand side management, which the water sector can also um, uh, apply or provide, uh, which is to shift the load from peaking um, uh, demand hour to off peak or standard time, uh, which will support the energy sector to shave their um, uh, uh, load or profile. Um, also, the water and energy network networks upgrade. So, when um, applying some uh, demand side or load shifting measures, this will offer the water infrastructure to be upgraded and refurb, um, uh, renovated. So, this will also um, support the water energy uh, networks. Uh, 
the financial challenges actually um, um, can also be um, tackled by the projects based revenues like the pond storage, like the more RE, the load management. So benefits sharing of both of those Nexus joint projects can be uh, of an added value and um, support the financial situation of both sectors. Uh, the affordable and um, the, optim yeah, the optimum goal, which is the affordable energy and water supply costs will lead eventually to the cost recovery and uh, hopefully removing the subsidies on both uh, sectors. So optimizing the management will um, uh, support the availability and affo affordability of energy and water for everyone in Jordan, which will lead uh, eventually to the sustainable development. So here, um, the coordination mechanism, I will um, explain a little bit about the work of this um, a steering committee uh, that I mentioned before. And this actually steering committee has formed um, a technical, um, a few technical working groups which are um, uh, working or investigating some aspects of, or some um, Nexus projects, Nexus um, uh, topics. So, uh, we have uh, currently uh, two working groups who are investigating the potential of uh, bomb storage uh, project in Jordan and uh, also application of load shifting um, uh, measures on uh, large water uh, supply systems. So as you can see, let's start here from um, uh, one or step one that the uh, steering committee uh, that is um, uh, uh, consisting from the Secretary General and the um, Managing Directors from relevant institutions identify the key aspects of the Nexus to be uh, tackled or worked on, and then they propose some ideas, some uh, solutions, and um, they form uh, working groups from uh, both uh, ministries and institutions to work on those um, projects and um, topics, I would say. Uh, the technical working group um, then investigates and uh, or um, are, are working on the investigation surveys feasibility studies and also um, uh, they will be supported by uh, logistical logistical support and uh, some uh, consultancy services um, especially for uh, uh, bomb storage and the load management that i will be uh, also uh, describing uh, later on and then uh, what is normally uh, done is that the working group, technical working groups on uh, senior um, management, med, med management, I would say level provides um, uh, recommendations for the steering committee. Uh, and they, uh, afterwards the steering committee um, uh, give the go, no go for those recommendations and organize um, the funding of, uh, of those joint measure which will eventually um, lead to the uh, Nexus win-win project's realization and um, uh, eventually the integrated strategic planning. So the components that has been the components that have been identified by the steering committee, um, uh, which uh, they uh, later on um, formed a technical working group to work on where the or let's maybe um, uh, formulate it in this way, that actually the um, key driver, I would say, for the water energy nexus dialogue and co establishing those coordination mechanisms were um, the bomb storage project and um, second is the high electric cost in the water sector. So those two main, I would say, drivers um, uh, led to, um, or um, uh, yeah, led to uh, establishing those coordination mechanisms to work on those. Mainly, um, they, they were, um, there were two uh, main, I would say, drivers, but afterwards they started to work on uh, other um, uh, projects and aspects. So um, the projects um, are the bombed storage, bombed electric, hyd um, bombed hydroelectric energy storage, feasibility study, um, which is uh, currently uh, being uh, conducted by both um, sectors by this uh, coordination mechanism. So the technical working group is um, coordinating the technical um, uh, part of this feasibility study and uh, uh, where the uh, high level decisions are needed, uh, they are um, providing the recommendations for the steering committee and this um, Joint Steering com Committee takes uh, actions and uh, decisions related to this feasibility study. 
So this feasibility study actually started late 2020 and um, it's ongoing, but it's in, in the final uh, stage, stage and it's being uh, concluded by both um, sector. So um, as mentioned uh, in this feasibility study, uh, many joint decisions um, were uh, required and I would say without this coordination mechanism, um, uh, the implementation of this feasibility study would be uh, so hard and the delays would uh, uh, also face, would be faced uh, uh, without having this, I mean, systematic regular coordination mechanism from both um, sectors from almost, as mentioned before, eight relevant institutions. So uh, from water sector, energy sector, and also from Ministry of Planning um, and Cooperation and from uh, Ministry of Finance as well. Uh, the Aqab the Amman uh, Water Desalination and Conveyance pro Project, the uh, short term is it's the national conveyor. We call it the national conveyor project is also being um, developed currently jointly by both sectors so they um, they are now investigating some um, energy solutions um, and also the project has um, um, has has been given a favorable i would say electricity tariff so it's it's not the same as the water pumping um, tariff it uh, it's now ha um, um, has um, a less i would say favorable t tariff to make the project um, more um, uh, sustainable and uh, attractive to the uh, private sector because it's um, going to be implemented by um, private sector participation based on uh, build operate transfer uh, uh, scheme. Uh, also within those coordination mechanisms or nexus cooperation, we call it um, uh, the implementation of ongoing RE projects in the water sector um, are also being investigated and um, facilitated by those coordination mechanism. Um, also, the strategic analysis of electricity tariff for water bombing. So at one point, the uh, electricity tariff for water bombing has been increased dramatically, where uh, this led to a huge um, increase in the annual electricity bill. But afterwards, the, um, this uh, steering committee um, uh, has um, yeah, um, met together and negotiated and afterwards they, um, I would say, reached to a compromise between both sector and reduced the electricity tariff for water bombing uh, to, um, uh, yeah, to a negoti uh, negotiated um, uh, price. Also, the, the two sectors or within this coordination mechanism, uh, they are developing some future water energy um, scenarios jointly. So the perspectives or the nexus goals uh, would be um, to integrate the management and governance between water and energy sector, to also improve the coordination and collaboration among institutions. So to have this systematic and regular um, coordination uh, to um, plan and prioritize and in integrated investment projects to um, enhance the planning and policy coherence and minimize conflict of interests and uh, boost the synergies to achieve an, an effective and integrated and sustainable management of both resources and to um, eventually and optimally reduce the financial burdens on both uh, sectors. So as mentioned, the, the ongoing projects and um, investigations or studies are the uh, bumped storage, um, bumped hydroelectric energy storage, uh, which um, um, helps um, or supports the energy transition and the climate protection. It's, um, yeah, as mentioned earlier, it um, helps or supports integrating more renewable energy and uh, um, supports the operation of the electric system with this uh, fluctuating energy so sources like uh, solar and wind. Uh, with this uh, project, the less fuel and less fuel, fossil fuel um, uh, uh, demand will um, be achieved. And um, the characteristics of this large scale mature technology is the high efficiency, the large storage capacity. Um, as mentioned, uh, mature, um, it's a mature proven uh, technology for decades. It has a long lifetime. It also has a low technological uh, risks and it's the least, I would say, it has the least electricity storage among other storage options. 
and uh, the long discharge time um, and the high uh, power, which reach up to uh, 1,000 1, mega megawatt or even uh, more. So in this feasibility study um, and business model in, in Jordan, project in Jordan, um, there were uh, some, or there was um, uh, what we call it the alternative assessment where uh, three sites in Jordan um, has been investigated, investigated for a uh, bomb storage uh, uh, project in, in Jordan. Those sites um, um, actually um, uh, with uh, existing reservoirs or dams are the Mujib, King Talal Dam and Wadi Al Arab Dam. Uh, the alternative um, assessments um, actually um, included capacity uh, with a range uh, between 75 megawatt to 675 megawatt and um, the full load hours, uh, uh, the range of the full load hours uh, um, is from six hours till 18, 18 hours. The main challenge actually, uh, because as, as um, already uh, mentioned, it's a, a Nexus project. It uh, uh, uses the water um, uh, from the dams to fill uh, the, reserve, the upper reservoir and uh, to release the water, to, to pump the water from lower to upper reservoir and then release it where uh, the energy is uh, required in, in the peaking uh, demand hour. So um, uh, we had actually the water availability challenge, which was a main challenge with um, the open loop um, solution, the open loop hydro bomb storage solution. But this actually um, has eventually tackled by uh, selecting the closed loop solution, which is um, to have two artificial reservoirs. So both reservoirs will be, uh, a lower reservoir will be built uh, in proximity to the existing dam and um, also an upper reservoir will be also constructed. In this way, the um, uh, water availability for this project will not be um, an issue. So the uh, water um, has been decided that the water for this project will be filled uh, for the first time on uh, in uh, uh, the rainy seasons and when um, we have uh, flooding events and uh, then the makeup or the compensation of the water annually can be also manageable. So it's not that um, significant uh, amount. And also with the open loop, we have this influence on operation um, of water supply schemes in construction and operation stages. But as mentioned, eventually both um, uh, sectors or the coordination um, working group and steering committee has decided eventually to have this closed loop where we have um, the lower reservoir also built, as mentioned, next to the Mujib. Mujib was selected as um, a most promising site for the first uh, project in Jordan. So as you can see, we have this uh, lo lower reservoir, the upper reservoir at an um, elevation difference of around 500 meter. We have this penstock and uh, yeah, the main components of this project, the shaft powerhouse and some other uh, components, which, um, uh -huh. um, so the um, uh, selected alternative, I would say that uh, has been investigated in depth um, um, the capacity is 450 megawatt, the full load hour is 7, uh, and the storage volume for both reservoirs is 2.6 million cubic meter with a uh, capex um, of around 550 million euros and uh, specific cost for this project of 1,223 per euro per kilo um, watt. Then we, ha um, we have uh, this also ongoing studies, um, as mentioned, which is um, to investigate the potential of um, uh, applying the load shifting or load management at um, four large um, water facilities. Um, as mentioned earlier, the public uh, water um, um, sector um, consumes around 10% and it's 15 to 16% with the irrigated agriculture. Um, and this is expected um, to be uh, increased to more than 20% with this um, uh, future uh, desalination, um, the National Conveyor Desalination Project, uh, which actually will require a huge amount of um, electricity to power this uh, project. As mentioned, it will provide 300 million cubic meter and this water has to be pumped 
uh, more than 300 kilometers from Aqaba to Amman and other governorates. So as you can see here in Jordan, we have um, a few uh, like uh, five main uh, large uh, systems which consumes more than 60% of the um, uh, total public um, uh, um, from the electricity consumption in the public water, uh, water se sector. So those uh, four systems, uh, as mentioned, the, load the application of load shifting at, at those four um, systems has been investigated and um, those recommendation has, recommendations have been submitted to the steering committee to, um, um, yeah, to um, um, see how to proceed. So some of those systems actually require um, some large investment, but um, they are, um, they would uh, actually uh, provide some um, uh, benefits for both sectors if, um, we have any just to give you a, a background also that the Jordanian water sector is um, or has a flat electricity tariff so uh, along the day it, it has a flat electricity tariff but currently with also connected to this load management um, application uh, the, the two committees are um, investigating um, uh, with the support of a consultant to um, have this differentiated energy tariff. So we have um, different time slots uh, and with different um, electricity tariffs. So cheap tariff uh, at the um, time where we have uh, solar energy and um, high, high tariff of, um, at the times where we have um, the peak demand hours um, in the country. So um, as uh, mentioned, the flexible management of water pumping can greatly contribute to uh, shaping the energy demand profiles, and um, uh, this can be achieved by shifting the loads of the water sector from energy peak um, uh, consumption hours to off peak um, or energy peak um, production hours. Um, uh, yeah, may specifically the solar energy um, uh, generation uh, hours. And th this flexible actually water uh, facility infrastructure requires, as mentioned, a large investment, therefore, to in incentivize or um, uh, make those projects feasible, we, um, we have to have um, a differentiated energy tariff uh, scheme uh, to initiate and ensure the feasibility of such uh, projects. Thank you, Hanin. I think we have to um, come to a close. We're 10 minutes over time. Yeah, I think this is the last, the, not the last slide, we still have two remaining slides, but I will start, I will try to be uh, very quick. So um, as mentioned, the advantages, for th those Nexus projects um, ha have advantage, advantages for both sectors. So for example, the load man management would offer or would uh, result in ge um, generation cost savings for both sectors actually. And um, for the energy sector, it will support um, or um, uh, lead to um, uh, avoiding the inefficient peaking power, power plants or the expensive power plants peaking units. Um, also, uh, generation cost savings is through higher RE penetration and um, uh, avoided grid, grid investment, uh, which will lead to also um, avoided uh, cost and savings eventually. For the water sector, as mentioned, energy cost savings and um, upgrade for the infrastructure and uh, this um, redundancy in infrastructure will uh, ensure satisfactory of uh, water provision and the automatic operation of water systems. So the last slide would be the key barriers for effective uh, win um, governance or uh, uh, I would say this um, coordination mechanism still, it's not the perfect um, um, structure to um, uh, lead to a proper governance or management um, for the water energy nexus in Jordan. So we still have some barriers for this um, um, target or uh, goal, nexus goal. So we still have uh, different levels of interest actually and expectations amongst the governmental officials from water and energy sectors. We still have some silo thinking um, uh, between, or um, I would say from officials, um, from some of the officials or some of the actors. Uh, also the lack of information or recognition of nexus um, interlinkages or synergies or even risks um, from um, 
uh, some uh, actors and the diff different development levels, um, different development levels and influence amongst those uh, two sectors. Uh, it's still uh, also the, this um, still lacks the formal and agreed uh, upon uh, nexus governance for the effective integrated planning. So as mentioned, those coordination mechanisms um, uh, have been successfully um, managing, I would say, the investment um, projects, but not uh, this. Uh, this is still not the perfect or the proper um, uh, formal structure to. Um, uh, achieve the effective integrated planning. So still in Jordan, we still don't have this um, formal structure for the Nexus effective planning. And last thing is the constant institutional changes um, amongst the, um, um, from, I mean, high level or even from uh, technical working groups, this also caused a disruption of the cooperation and dialogue and even uh, the um, uh, level of, um, um, understanding or um, knowledge amongst those uh, uh, officials and actors uh, from both sectors. So thank you, everyone, and um, I I look forward for your questions and discussions uh, with regards to this um, uh, water energy nexus and water energy uh, uh, coordination and cooperation in Jordan. Thank you, Anin. Thank you very much for your input. Um, thank you again as well to Ines, to our two uh, speakers today. I think it has been yeah, very interesting. Um, our Q&A tool was used quite a lot, so uh, Ines already answered um, a lot of questions coming from the audience. Um, however, since we are already quite a lot over time, um, I suggest that we can follow up on the open questions. Um, and I would also like to encourage you to keep track um, on, well, first on the uh, FAOD group where you can subscribe, but also on our website, the water resource platform um, under www.water-energy-food.org. We will post um, the link into the chat now. Um, there will be a follow-up article on this um, webinar and we will definitely make sure to share the presentations with you. So you will be able to access the presentations um, either via our website or uh, the FAO uh, D group. We will also translate the presentations into French. So we also aim to, yeah, in the future, um, organize some more webinars and exchange rounds on the topic of uh, WEF Nexus, um, especially you will also hear um, about the developments on the Water Energy Nexus Working Group that was just presented by Hanin. Um, yeah, I thank you very much, uh, the audience, for joining us today and wish you a nice um, afternoon and day, wherever you are. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>